Good evening and welcome. I'm John Godfrey. On behalf of the Wallenberg Committee and the Rackham Graduate School of the University of Michigan, it is our pleasure to welcome you to the 17th annual Wallenberg Lecture. This evening, we honor Sompap Chanchaka, who has traveled from the city of Chiang Rai in northern Thailand to be with us. The Wallenberg Medal helps to preserve the memory of Raoul Wallenberg, a graduate of this university. It honors extraordinary individuals who, like Wallenberg, have the resilience, tenacity, and moral courage to understand that in times of crisis, when justice and dignity face the greatest hazard, the human spirit can persist and triumph. This medal honors those exceptional persons who, through great moral energy and perseverance, and with hearts that are alive to truth, find their way over, through, or around the indifference and inaction of others. We have with us this evening a truly gentle but bold man who, in his life and work, embodies the fierce humanitarian convictions of Raoul Wallenberg. Like our honored guest this evening, Wallenberg was a master of the craft of the possible, the decent, the humane, in the face of very long odds. Wallenberg arrived in Budapest from neutral Sweden in late 1944 to try to pull from the ashes of Europe one of the last populations of Jews that had not yet been sent to the death camps. Charming, courageous, and relentlessly determined, Wallenberg was cunning in his service to humanity. A diplomat in the last circle of hell, he learned that when persuasion failed, bluster might work. He mobilized the desperate, and working with the companions he recruited, pulled thousands to safety under the shield of Swedish neutrality, holding on to lives while he played for time, waiting for the war to end. Wallenberg improvised the possible in the face of the impossible. Through his implacable spirit in the face of the unspeakable, Raoul Wallenberg helped save as many as 100,000 persons from the death camps. Arrested by Soviet agents and fading into the gulag, he disappeared into the darkness from which he had saved so many. But Wallenberg's spirit is certainly with us this evening. For Sampap Chantraka's life and work, his commitment to the people of Thailand and the wider Mekong region is testimony to how one person can make a difference. I would like to take a moment to recognize a group of people who I hope are with us, volunteers of the Peace Corps, who share in the belief that one person can make a difference. It was at a late night speech here on this campus, on the steps of the Michigan Union during the 1960 presidential campaign, that John F. Kennedy first announced the idea of a national organization for service abroad. In the decades that followed, graduates of the University of Michigan have joined many others, fanning out across the world as volunteers in the Peace Corps, putting into action the vision of President Kennedy one that echoed the commitment of Raoul Wallenberg. We are honored to have with us this evening a number of returned Peace Corps volunteers. Among them, I would like to mention, is Rebecca Parham from Boston, who, as a volunteer in Thailand a number of years ago, encountered Sompap Chantraka when he was a young teenager adrift on the streets, recognized his gifts, and encouraged him to go to school. She, too, is evidence that one person can make a difference. I also want to recognize four special University of Michigan students who last year were the first recipients of the Wallenberg Summer Travel Fellowships. While he was a student here in the 1930s, Raoul Wallenberg spent his summers traveling across North America to observe and learn and learn from people of all kinds on their own terms. This experience helped him understand the human condition and shaped his lifelong concern for human dignity 
and humanitarian values. The Wallenberg Committee, with generous support from Bob Bagramian and Linda Bennett, has provided these fellowships to enable students to take part in a community service project or civic action or to humanitar uh, explore humanitarian issues not well understood in the US. Students take these fellowships and travel all over the world. In the summer of 2007, recipients included Swapna Jayaraman, who's a doctoral student in engineering, who spearheaded the establishment of a new center for children in impoverished neighborhoods in Chennai, India. Grace Liu, a biochemistry major, worked with an organization to deliver clinical care and health education to women and children in Puno, Peru. Stephanie Curtis, an undergraduate student in nursing, volunteered in a community hospital in a small city in Honduras and helped provide supplies and equipment to the clinic. And Ashley Searles, an undergraduate who's majoring in history, worked this past summer with Operation Crossroads in West Africa. Now, I am pleased to introduce Teresa Sullivan, the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University of Michigan, who will present the Wallenberg Medal to Kun Chandraka. Good evening, and thank you, John. I am pleased to welcome you all to the 2008 Wallenberg Award Ceremony and Memorial Lecture. On behalf of the University of Michigan, it's my honor to welcome His Excellency Mr. Grid Ganjana Gunshan, the Ambassador of Thailand to the United States. His wife, Mrs. Rawiwan Ganjana Gunshan, and Mr. Narong Sasitorn, the Consul General for Thailand in Chicago. We're glad that they could join us for this special event. Let's give them a Michigan welcome. I also want to thank the many individuals who've made tonight's program possible. The Wallenberg Award and Lecture grew from the hearts and minds of faculty and staff here at the university who knew of Raoul Wallenberg's humanitarian actions and his connection to Michigan. Through the work and financial contributions of many people, the award and lecture program developed. In 2006, the support for the Wallenberg Endowment enabled the fund to begin offering fellowships to students interested in international humanitarian work as you just heard. The university is grateful to the hundreds of universities, uh, individuals who make this ongoing memorial to Raoul Wallenberg possible. The Wallenberg Lecture this year is a particularly appropriate time to reflect on how one person's life can make a difference. A little over a month ago, Congressman Tom Lantos of California passed away. Representative Lantos was the only Holocaust survivor to serve in the United States Congress. Born in 1928, he grew up in Budapest and was part of the resistance movement against the Nazis during the German occupation of Hungary. Twice he escaped from forced labor camps. He lived for a time in a safe house that had been created by Raoul Wallenberg. Mr. Lantos credited Wallenberg and the identity documents he provided with saving his life. Becoming an American by choice in the post-World War II era, Lantos went on to serve 14 terms in Congress and become one of its most prominent advocates for human rights. In developing policy and in small individual acts, Representative Lantos undertook work that fought injustice and offered hope to others. His life is a model for the many ways in which an individual can make a difference. We're gathered here tonight to honor Sompop Juntranka, the founder of the Development and Education Program for Daughters and Communities. DEPDC, as it is known, is located in northern Thailand. 
Its work is to prevent the trafficking of women and children into the sex industry and other exploitive situations. Since 1989, Mr. Juntraga has worked to identify children in poverty-stricken families who are at risk of being sold into the sex trade and intervene before that happens. DEPDC provides a safe haven and education and job training for individuals. It also works with communities in economic development programs that address poverty, the precursor to human trafficking throughout the Mekong River region. Beginning with a small group of 19 children, DEPDC has now served more than 1,000 children. Mr. Gentraga's vision is remarkably clear and brilliantly simple. Intervene before children are sold into the sex trade. Educate them so that they have the tools to prevent exploitation and to provide them with job skills that will keep their families from poverty and the desperation that accompanies it. There are studies and statistics that provide overwhelming evidence that intervention before children are placed in exploitive situations is the most effective way to address this problem. Early intervention reduces costs, reduces criminal activity, and reduces the loss of productive citizens. While the data make a compelling case, it is the words of the DEPDC students that best capture the value of the program. Pensi Nubang was in the initial group of 19 children that Mr. Jumtraga worked with. She is now the business manager of DEPDC. She says, he gave me a dream of a better life and the chance to achieve it. The program that Mr. Jintraga began in Northeast Thailand is now well established. It has dormitories, schools, radio and internet training programs, gardening and agricultural programs, and financial support for students who want to receive advanced training. I learned earlier this evening that it even has a 50 meter swimming pool. Confident that the organization could sustain itself, Sompop has handled day-to-day -day administration to others and expanded his own work to help children from Laos, China, and Myanmar, countries which border Thailand. While the international reach of those who traffic in other human beings is disturbing, the effectiveness of the DEPDC programs gives us hope for children throughout the region. Mr. Gentraga's own life story is a wonderful reminder of the power of individual actions. Growing up on the streets in southern Thailand, he hustled for spare change in the alleys and back streets of Surat Thani. An American Peace Corps volunteer offered him an education and a chance to change his life. He has built upon that generosity to create an impressive and effective organization that makes a real difference in the lives of the world's most vulnerable individuals, poor children. In thinking about Mr. Jintraga and the wonderful spiral of one act of kindness leading to many others, I'm reminded of Anne Frank. She too faced a world in which vulnerable individuals and groups suffered enormously. And she too believed in the power of individuals to make a difference. She wrote, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. Mr. Gentraga, your work exemplifies the ideals of humanity, courage, and hope that motivated Raoul Wallenberg. The University of Michigan is honored to present you with the Wallenberg Medal. Would you please come forward?
Good evening, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, faculty and students from the University of Michigan, ladies and gentlemen from Ann Arbor and surrounding communities. It is a great honor for me and my family to be with you this evening to accept the Raoul Wallenberg Medal. I am humbled to be a recipient to this great award. I would like to offer my sincere appreciation to Wallenberg Executive Committee and Professor John Godfrey, Chief of the Committee, Jill McDonald, and Wendy Asioni. I especially thank my wonderful family for supporting me all these years, my former Peace Corps volunteer, teachers, and her son. Many others have made my presence here possible. I would also like to thank all of the daughters, son, and supporters of DPC around the world for their continuing support and dedication to children. All of these people have contributed to the work of child rights, protection, to combat human trafficking, and all other forms of child exploitation. I am deeply grateful to them. I am grateful for this opportunity to share some of my life and my work with you. Human trafficking involves the movement of people from place to place in order to exploit them. Anyone can be trafficked, but children and women are most vulnerable because they still have the least power in our society. They are trafficked by the thousands into slavery for the second industry and other forms of exploitation, forced labor. Most trafficking victims are from very poor communities and are forced to find work outside their village. Trafficking agents exploit these vulnerable people and make money from their labor. A complex web of hidden trafficking and crime network move people from origin to destination with several opportunities for people to make money on the way. Trafficking happens all over the world. Almost no community is unaffected. Even if its members don't know about the problem, it is a social problem, not an individual problem. And it must be solved by society by upholding universal human rights and the value and dignity of each person. Let me tell you some of my story. I was born into a very poor family in the province of Suratani in the south of Thailand. There were seven other sisters and brothers. My father had lots of different jobs. Creating fields, cutting wood, gardening, clearing forest, carry, carrying materials anything he could get. My mother and my sister worked in the mineral mines, and by the time I was 10 or 11, I worked with them. It was a very hard time of my life that I remember. Not every child in my family could go to school or finish their education. My brothers and my sister learned only how to read and write. I was lucky as the first son I was sent to school. I lived with my grandmother and later with her sister because the rest of my family moved a lot to follow the job with mining company. I also had to work to help support myself and the house. This means that I spent most of my time on the street picking up cans, plastic bottles to sell. Well, it seemed like a good time for me because I was free and I usually had something to eat. Occasionally, when I had enough money, I could buy some ice cream. It was much better than being with my family and having nothing to eat. Sometimes I went with other boys and put ice cream in a cooling box. All day we walked and we went around the communities and say, anyone want ice cream? And then I say ice cream until it's finished and we get back again. 
we get some kind of two or three baht per day. But at least we have some ice cream left at the bottom of the box for us to eat. And it doesn't make any profit because it's equal. Whilst I was in the second school, I met a foreigner. Her name was Rebecca, but we call her Becky. We like to say, hi, Becky, hi, Becky. Yeah. She was a Peace Corps volunteer from Boston, and she taught English at my school. This was very interesting to me, because it was the first time in my life that I had seen someone very different. Becky was an adult who spoke very politely to the children and brought interesting things like song, cartoons, pictures, and story to classes. This stopped me from running away from the class and missing lessons because she made them so much fun. Students want to participate in everything she taught. My teacher's kindness to her students all other children in the town and her pets, dogs, many dogs, cats sometimes, puppies, later, made an impress, impression on me. Well, I used to be a lot of conflicts with the dogs. As a street kid and a dog is not friendly. Street kid and dog have, have conflicts, you can imagine. But when I grew up, I realized this, is, this kindness is very important. I realized that kindness and care help children grow. Well, my English got better, and that changed my way of thinking. English allowed me to imagine my life and the world differently, thanks to stories like Peter Pan, Mary Poppins, the sound of music, the happy prince and the swallow. You might forget that already, but I still remember that story. When I heard the music and saw those people trying to do something good to improve their life, I compared it to myself all the time. Could I do something similar? What could I be? I dreamed that one day I would be able to speak good English and have opportunities to travel Vacation camps set by Peace Corps volunteers give me the chance to practice English and to travel. I was very excited to learn about being able to live for a while with so many foreigners. I got scholarships for three years to these summer camps. These opportunities kept me from going back to the street, to working in the mines or to the graveyard. To me, it was like getting a new life. It pushed me to learn English even more and more. English took care of me. English took care of me. It allowed me to continue my education. I later took a provincial test and had the highest score. I also took an entrance test for an excellent senior high school in the far south of Thailand. My entrance score identified me as one of the best students, and I was admitted. Becky has taken some of her students on a few trips there, and I had dreamed, if I study here, maybe after a few years, I can go to the US. But the school costs a lot. I worked over the summer and found odd jobs during the school year to support myself. Here, I met my future wife. We were in the same class. She understood my situation and often helped. Now she works as hard as I do for children's rights in the same area where I am, in Chiang Rai. After graduation, I enrolled in Chiang Mai University in the northern of Thailand. After trying several times, several majors, I ended up with a BA in political science. It took me eight years to graduate because I had to stop classes free and leave to earn money for tuition, books, and survival. During my time at university, I play music and start a folk band called Preo Tien. 
cannot fail. Song for life. We sang for justice, for environment, for peace, for children, women, and farmers. We also play for the political student movement at public demonstration and strike, standing up for democracy. I worked as a guide for trekking tours. I made use of my English by taking groups of tourists into the hills and villages of the jungle. I made connections and formed good relationships with many foreigners. I also learned to communicate in local dialect and to understand the hill tribes culture of Aka, Lahu, Lisu, and Karen. Most of them were in Chiang Mai and some of them are in Chiang Rai area. The work was good, but I saw a lot of poor people with problems I could not solve. Many of the hill tribe people were sick and uninformed about health care. I took along clothes, food, vitamins, and medicine. I learned later that their children were being trafficked for the sex trade. While I was studying political science, I learned to do research on the poverty and cooperate village projects. My Japanese friend and my journalist, Michiko Inakaki, asked me to help collect information about child abuse, sex exploitation, and child prostitution. We looked at the sex industry in central, northern, and southeast and southern parts of Thailand. There were differences in the sex industry in each region. We start in the protos, massage parlor, and karaoke bars of Bangkok. Most of, most of the customers were foreigners. The girls there told us about their difficulties in life, how little money they make from their work, and how they become sex workers. Many of these young girls got only 30 to 40 percent of what they earned from the owner. They were not allowed to say no to any kind of different guests. They had debts that they could never pay out. Many girls had tried to run away from their contracts. Sometimes they escaped, but they were usually followed and taken back and often severely punished. So many of the stories of the girls were very bad. In northern Chiang Rai, the condition was very diff different. Most of the customers were from the area around. There were many sex trade centers, but here the girls could pay off their debt. Some girls were able to run away with their boyfriend. The conditions in the South were much stricter. We learned that most of the customers were from Malaysia. Together, we interviewed many sex workers and made many tracks to meet with the families and community the girls were from. After collecting a lot of information, the root causes of trafficking and the sex trade appear to be the same everywhere. The majority of them came from poor, broken, and troubled family. Another cause was drug abuse, opium, and heroin. They need a lot of money to support their addiction. And yet another root cause was parents who desperately need money for long-term HIV or cancer treatment. They had to borrow money all the time. Girls in the northern province from hill tribes and bordering countries had no resident status, no ID, and therefore no rights. They could not get any jobs to become part of the Thai society. A final cause was broken relationship between teenage boys and girls. They marry at a very young age, 14, 15, but break up after one or two years. But by the time they separate, they already have a child, and the girl has no knowledge, no job, nowhere to go, so they find a job as sex workers. In almost every village, there are people with connection to trafficking and sex business. They look for vulnerable girls who are easy to coerce. There are lots of those people among the hill tribe, and especially along the borders. In the Golden Triangle, 
where the borders of Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand meet. I went to many guest houses and met with many street kids. I recognized the problem and the pattern. The, the, the Golden Triangle is very especially dangerous for abandoned children. Many gangs operate there. Because there, the five children from Laos, Myanmar, South China, and several huge tribes all in the same place. But even in the Golden Triangle, people say to me, the sex trade here is small in comparison to Maasai. That place that stopped me. I found out that there was a link to the sex trade between the middlemen of these border towns and the rest of Thailand. These middlemen were also connected to Malaysia, Japan, Singapore, China, and others. Everything revolved around these towns. So it is with good reason that I found the daughter's education program there. I start research with village leaders, teachers, governor, immigration officers, and others. I met a man from Australia. Very interesting. I tried to learn from the foreigner because they were the one who got into the place very often. For the last 15 years, he has spent most of his time, his life in this area, just to sleep with young girls. You know this place? I asked. Although there were 50, altogether there were 58 brothels in a small city. That was in 1989. He just went into anywhere and said hello. He was a very good friend with the girls in almost every brothel. This man doing like that every day, almost very often. Many of them call him dad or papa. And he would act funny, make noise, and speak half Thai, half English, like a play. But he used many of them, even the 10 years old. This man had no sense of beauty at all. This is just the way things are around here, he said to me. Sompop, do what you do, and I do what I do. But if you want to know what I do, you just follow me and see what it is like. That was what he said to me. I said, okay. But I told you that I am doing a study about children working in the sex industry. He said, why? Well, they just go to school, I answer. No, he said. They can't go to school because they don't have any money or nobody wants them. How do you know that? I asked. They told me, he said. They may have told you that, but maybe, I said, that they could be changed. Well, what you want to do? There are thousands of children. This is only a small percentage of young people in this border town who actually belong there. Most of them are from elsewhere, Myanmar, Laos, South China, or various hill tribes, city. Around 60 kilometers away, the girls all spend a short time in this city where they go train for the sex trade. In one to three months, the girls get documentation and placement with pimps throughout Thailand, Malaysia, and elsewhere. So this border town is like a transit station, a temporary protos for the girls. Many of them are still virgins when they arrive, having no idea what they are going to get into. But here, they get sex training, basic language skills, and learn self-protection. In self-protection, they are taught never to tell anyone they are under 18 because of the law. You know? And when we ask the girls in vacation or whatever, they will say, I am 19, I am 20. And never to tell if they had just come from Myanmar because they would be arrested. 
They also are taught to tell people that they have parents in Thailand or they, they are Thai. Maybe they will not check any ID card. Sometimes parents ask a middleman to negotiate a price for their daughters and to sign paper. Even ID cards, body pass, and travel documents are falsified here. It involves involve, involve many different kinds of gangs and people. The South is the biggest destination for Chiang Rai children. About 3,000 kids are trafficked there from Chiang Rai, according to my research. So it is part of the sex trade that the children are taken away, far away from their homes, from Chiang Rai to the South, from Laos to Thailand, from the province of Songkhla to Narathiwat border of Malaysia. In this place, there are about hundreds of protos, each with about 50 girls. So I start going into the village, searching for the parents of those children I have spoken with. I met with families, local people. Village chiefs and huge tribe leaders, they were encouraging children to go to the south. Wait a minute, I said, what are you doing? Children are going to the work, they said. Don't you have any children here that want to go to school? No, no, no. Nobody here wants to study. They were laughing at me. You must be joking, they said. Do you have a lot of money? Give it to me and we will have some good business for you. Don't ever spend it on sending these children to school. That's what they said. So I spoke to the girls themselves. Do you want to go to school? I asked. Yes, one of them said. But my mother already accepted some money, so I can't. Where are you going? We are going to work in the restaurant. And that was almost 20 years ago when I couldn't do anything, even though these children were right in front of me. Hundreds of kids whom I met during my survey of the area left the village, even while I was talking to their families and the village leaders. In many villages, you don't see the girls above the age of 13. What's happened to them? I turned to a few girls that were left behind, and I asked their parents, what about these young girls? Oh, they will go next year. They said, she has been booked already. She's still in fifth grade, but when she's in sixth grade, she can go. That girl was only 13 years old, and she was at risk. This was the first time I realized that there was a specific target group that was at risk. I share this information with UNICEF, with journalists of CNN, ABC, and BBC News, and other media more and more. These girls become recognized and the priority for my work of prevention. That's when my work really began in 1989. In my first document for DEP, I wrote a definition of children at risk children whose family are involved in the sex trade, whose parents are drug addicted, who come from broken families, who migrate, and who have no ID, no home, no rights, and no hope. All these children are an easy prey for middlemen and the scouts. And then there are children whose parents need money for medical care, and those who have been sexually abused. The last group is especially at risk because everyone around these girls know that they have lost their virginity. They become embarrassed. And everywhere they go, people point at them. Their parents no longer want them at a responsibility and send them to work in the sex trade. At the start of my prevention work, I met 
with about 35 at-risk at girls. Some of them had already been booked for the next trade. They were almost gone. So I tried to convince the girls, their parents, the teachers, the village leaders, to not to sell these young girls. I told them that, well, I had some money so that these girls could go to school in the town. At that time, I had no plan to start an NGO at all. I just want to stop something that was wrong and that was right in front of me. Maybe I could use my salary of 30,000 baht, that's around 1,000 US dollar. And I did it. I did use my money that I got from Japanese friend for the survey and for the research. Two months later, Michio Inagaki paid that money back to me. But when I went back to the village, from those 35 at-risk girls, only 19 of the girls were left. The others had gone to brothels, were missing or had run away. In my interview, I had promised that I could prevent them from having to go into the sex trade. Do you want to go to school? Yes, if we could, they said. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, I repeat. But how? How? I can take you to school and put you in the school. I will provide you with documents and I will buy some clothes, some shoes, some socks, some bags, books, pen, pencils. Yes, they said. Yes, if that's free, maybe we'll talk with parents and we will go to school. I said, okay, let's go to talk with your parents. You've got scholarship. You've got scholarship. You go to school for free. It brought a smile to my face. That's the first time. So I brought these 19 girls to go to school in Masai. I bought them uniforms. I called Japan, NGO, the Asian Children Fund. I had only a little money left, and I asked them the funds if they could send me some money, some more money. I didn't know. I didn't know how they support me, but they did send some money to me. I put this girl in the school for five or six of these daughters. Could not go back home because of the sexual abuse by a relative, drug addicted, or gangs. Twelve girls were far away from the area where we are. That present me with a problems because I had to go back home to my family. The city is waiting. Kwang is waiting. My family is waiting. But this girl could not go back home. They were still at risk even they got into the school. So I said to the parents, I need your permission for your daughters to stay with me for at least three years. This is enough time for her to complete secondary school. I made a deal with them. If you withdraw the contract, you have to pay back the full amount of the scholarship that I gave to your daughter. They agreed, and they guaranteed that their daughters would complete their education in three years. I signed the contract and hoped that the project would succeed. This was the start of the daughter education program, which would grow into a development and education program for daughters and community. From the beginning, I learned how difficult it is to negotiate with parents Sometimes I could persuade them. At the time, I had to pray with them, beg them, or borrow them into the allowing their child to attend school, even for free. Often I start with, how are you doing? How is your daughter? It's pity that they had never seen their daughter's potential and thought they were lazy and good for nothing. So I had to work very hard to convince them that education works. It's difficult to change people's minds. There were a lot of people who misunderstood what I am doing, what our group are doing. Some accused us as a brainwashing, 
the girls to become servants of religion's cult groups. Police came to investigate, and military men said to me, Sompop, you are destroying the image of our country. In the rest of the world, by, opening, by openly saying that children are being abused in the sex trade, you criticize police, policemen, you talk about a lack of education, and you say that children don't get opportunities because they don't get government support. You talk about child labor and trafficking all the time. Well, I had to answer them, I mean, very politely. They carry guns. So I get angry, but I, I have to make it. The rarity of the sex trade is making Thailand image worse and worse. That's what I said. Maybe we are not dealing with all the problems of our country here, but you cannot sweep the problems under the rug. I always say that we have problems. Not that we have solutions, but giving time, I think people will understand what we are doing. Some seriously threatened to close down our centers. I call one person, very important person, Dr. Saisuri Jutikun, the first woman who fought with the law, the policy, the government, and with the international standard over the years she has provided us much help and guidance. In 1994, Ashoka, innovator for the public, made me an Ashoka Fellow. This stipend for the next three years support me and my family so that I could launch DPD without difficulties. In 1989, 1998, the vision of DPDC moved across the border with my second Ashoka Fellowship. There, was, there were so many skills that I had learned at school and at the university. But what had they taught me those eight years for my BA? For a while, I had hate myself for what I could not remember and couldn't do it. But soon I realized that I should not blame myself because when I was young, I couldn't imagine anything else. Instead. I should think for myself and think of training and critical thinking and so on. What I had to do was to put my life into the life of those children and really understand them. This is how I just discovered inside out education. Inside out education. Many times education is approached by bringing new knowledge in from the outside in. But I have found that the most effective forms of education is to learn inside out, learning from what we already know. I asked the girls, what makes you happy in your life? We are sitting and then we just start talking. And they start to talk about what makes them happy and what brings you unhappiness in your life. How is it difficult? They are very simple things to ask, but it allowed them to recognize things close to them. Talk about your parents. Talk about yourself. Why did your father beat you? How do you feel about that? It was hard to learn from this in the beginning, but by challenging them in that way, they started to think for themselves about their life and their world. And they began to understand that not only were the parts of the world, but that they were also parts of the problem. In itself, this was not a solution, but it did make a start with life skill training that became my first subject in training the daughter at the PDC. After that, I saw that I could reach them better and better. In their heads, their fears, in their jealousy. Little by little, the mentalities start to change. Peer groups were developed to share, love and take care of each other, like brother and sister, like a family. 
Those relationships offer them rehabilitation like a family reunion at home. A youth school, study tour, human rights organizations, daycare centers, even prisons, and environments organization, I brought all of my DPC daughters to have a look. Come, have a look, learn, see, and come back to report on what they had experienced. Like learning by dialogue, direct education. So the second step was direct education. It helps them to develop their life skill and social skills. They become like young social worker after they have been in DPC for five or six years. Since then, DPC has linked up with women and children organizations, UNICEF, Expat International, Ashoka. Over the past 10 years, we just grow, grow, grow. So there are many young people from the area that come to our center, and a whole new generation of, stud of students is coming. My assistants, Somporn and Puong Tong, are from one of my class in 1990. Ten of my former students were working there, but they have now moved to another area. And from the first group of daughters, talking about 19 young girls at the first group, two of them still work in the center right now with me. Pensi Inobang is the coordinator of Mekong Youth Net, a training project for youth leaders from six countries who start up provincial projects in their own country. Ram Jai Jai Joy is the coordinator of the administration department. Today, there are five young women in the directing team working to assist Alinda, the new director of the EPCC. One of the things I did recently is making a list of key issues for prevention, protection, and rehabilitation. Prevention cannot be just focused on the children. It is the whole environment and surrounding them that makes them at risk next to the brothel owners and middlemen. There is a whole blood sucker cycle of people who have wasted interest in sexual slavery. In the cycle are parents, aunts or uncles, village leaders, taxi driver, tour guides, banker, policemen, and member of the border patrol, and overtly respectable business men and officials. Protection also has many key issues, rehabilitation, repatriation, reintegration, reunion, safety, follow-up, sustainable income and jobs, to name a few. A special aspect of protection is the performance of a good luck or welcome ceremony of forgiveness when young girls rejoin their family, the community or tribes that they came from. This is very important. For rebuilding trust is difficult. These children have been away from their community for just a long, long time, maybe from when they are 10 years or even younger. So their attitudes and personality have changed, and perhaps they cannot even communicate or talk in their dialect anymore. They have lived at the age of that young, and 10 or 15 years later, that was a very big gap. They have to be brought up to date. Otherwise, after one month or two months, when they went back home again, they didn't want to stay anymore. Our work focused on prevention, protection, return, and repatriation. The EPDC is a place of happy children because the daughters and sons who live and study there know they are safe and they are learning that they have choice for their life. They are becoming empowered to change the circumstances so that they do not see themselves as victims or nothing. We have a multidisciplinary team approach that includes working with government, NGOs, 
in our halfway home for cross-border issues. We also have Chai Voice Radio that the youth and the children will broadcast the news and the story about children. The 24 hours a day Chai help phone, free call. There have been people in my life who have been example to me. The wisdom of His Majesty, the King of Thailand, has benefited everyone, especially grassroots organizations like DPDC. His Majesty Agriculture, Environmental, Cultural, and Economic projects continue to provide Thailand with a greater opportunity for the future. My Peace Corps volunteer teacher inspired me to take advantage of opportunities to build a better life. She demonstrates kindness, nonviolence, and patience for seeing the results. In this way, I feel that she helps raise me. Her example show me how to be both teacher and like a parent to daughters and sons. At DPGC, I don't think about how much time, money, and energy a daughter or son might need. Becky has strong instincts for giving and change-making. If the Buddha were here today, I think he would say that selling children or accepting money from human trafficking is a sin. It hurts to see girls and boys enslaved in brothels or anywhere. If you can protect one child, you protect future generations. And I want to thank the university for this singular honor. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. So, we'll, we'll take some questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sampap. Now, we have some time for some questions. If any of you would have questions you'd like to ask Sampap, but we must insist that since we're taping this, that you use one of the two microphones that have been set up. So does anybody? We'll, we'll, we'll wait for the... Yes. I'm a local Democrat, a progressive Democrat. My name's Tom Partridge, and I want to salute you for your life's work and your dedication and your achievements. You are an inspiration to your own country, to this country, and to the world, sir. And <laughs> I would like to know if you would propose that uh, American cities, as well as European cities, adopt your, the plan that you've worked out for your own country. Thank you. I think uh, the background of European countries and America society is much different from Thailand, I think. You have very strong social control, and you have a strong education system. You have come up with a lot of quality and potential of the social uh, st structures. Uh, I think you can, you can decide appropriately to protect these kind of problems in different ways or similar ways. 
but still, I think we have to link learning experience. You know, there are lots of things that Americans and European people will not understand the dimensions of the culture. That's why many people, when they go to Asia, they just think, believe that to buy young girls, prostitutes, is to help them. Many times that I, I have to talk with them that this is not the right idea that you're thinking that they, they are there already and they have, I have to buy them and it will help them. So this is kind of the dimension of the values and the social you know, issues. But again, I think education is, is for everyone that we can learn, we can change. I also learned how to care, how to love from my Peace Corps volunteer. You see that it's universal. Love, care, share, protection. Prevention is universal. Like God, you know, God provides this kind of things for the earth. Everyone can benefit from it. So it's not mine. It's not Thailand. It's, it's universal. It's human being. It belongs to human. So. Thank you. Uh, Steve Modell, you've clearly been able to lift the lives of countless children. Have you been able to follow the impact of your programs on the families? Very good, thank you. Well, at the beginning, I, I have a hard time to deal with the families. I, you know, many times they shut the doors when they went into their house. They just, want, just don't want to talk to me. That's why you know, it needs a lot of patience when you want to prevent children. So I try to build up a good relationship all the time. Sometimes I apologize, I try to explain. One thing that can help, if you work very well with adults, and you explain to the daughter, and that will be a good wish to link you with the parents. So many times when I go to the, back to the family, I will not go alone or talk without daughters, but the daughter will talk for me sometime. So that kind of thing creates a good relationship. I believe that the girls improved its impacts to the families directly. And when one family shows that something changed in that family, the second family will look at it we view that this is some, some new, new choice. So, you know, at the beginning, it doesn't work, but five years later, they know that, oh, children from the EPDC, daughters can stand up and say and talk and make, make very uh, important role to participate in the movement of the village, you know, maybe the social works, volunteer, daycare center, healthcare center, whatever. That's how it goes. It goes slowly, but it's, it, you see the change and now it's changed all over Thailand in the north. This is what we call the domino effect. <laughs> yes, please. My daughter. Um, I'm Marissa Modell, and I was, we're, um, my mom, my dad, and me, we're going back to Thailand, and we want to help this organization. How can you help it? You are helping me <laughs> so much. When I just heard here, girl talking like this, it just come to my heart. You make me much stronger. You know that. Even you have not that arrived Thailand yet, you can see. So you, can you imagine that when you arrive Thailand and you call, you get in touch with organization, <coughs> and I invite you to join to meet with the girls there. Your dad, your mom, can go there and stay there for a while and. If you know how to play, you know how to sing, can you know how to cook? <laughs> right? You know how to sing English song? Interesting. Do you know any games from your primary school, kindergarten? Mm -hmm. The teacher taught you a lot of games, right? We don't know much games, so please come play games with our kids. You help them. Thank you. I was wondering what um, other root cause or solutions you saw for to attack the root causes of the families feeling like they had to were forced to sell their children for, you know, to contribute to human trafficking.
Well, I think uh, to solve the problem of human trafficking has to come up with almost every level. Prevention is one thing that we need to work in the village, in the school, in the community, where we are talking about the demand side, uh, talking about the supply side, right? But not many people are talking about the, the demand side. Supply side, that means you know, families, village, girls. But demand side means the market. Has anybody talked with the protos owner, massage parlors, restaurant owners, or those who are going to benefit from children? You know, there is not much movement yet in the society to solve that kind of things. So I think it's very important that uh, we have to focus on that kind of solution, not just only focus on prevention at the girls, like what I'm saying, where DPC has started up in a small town and they view prevention as a priority. But it doesn't mean that it's going to work just only with DPC strategy. There must be a lot of different kind of network coming to the, you know, this kind of uh, uh, combat against human trafficking. Academic students, university professors, you know, law school, human rights school, social work school, they have to come up with some kind of progress, idea, movement. They can reach lots of thousand people, and those thousand people can reach 10,000 people. That kind of thing can also stop, you know, can also expand network, and you can feel that the more you get in touch with more people, it's growing and growing. The area of traffic is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You know. And they have the place to go. There are eyes, ears, minds, hearts everywhere. Okay, this world is dangerous. We have to make it dangerous for traffickers. Make it more dangerous for traffickers that will stop it. Thank you. Have you yourself encountered many dangers as you do your work, since certainly a lot of people would like you not to do it, so they continue to make money off these children? At the beginning, I think I, I was almost got killed and almost got, uh, you know, uh, hurt many times. But from time to time, I, I learned how to, how, to deal, how to deal with this kind of thing. Not to compromise, not to compromise. But to deal means that you have to learn where and which one is your friends, which is enemy, which is good people. By being good to villagers, by being friendly with children, by you know, uh, sin be sincere with the uh, military people or police, you know. So anyway, you make friends, even they are different, much different from you. Like you remember that in my presentation, I talk about a guy from Australia. Actually, he is very difficult. He is much difficult. He will talk one verse and swear three. You know, can you imagine that? <laughs> so I have to patient that, you know, to deal with this guy. I don't put in this presentation. It's, <laughs> it's very interesting words I have never learned in my life. My peace call teacher, Becca, uh, Rebecca doesn't teach me. She didn't teach me. <laughs> I, I didn't understand what kind of meaning of this thing. That is the kind of things, you know, it's, it's, you have to negotiate with that kind of people. And many times I talk with the proto owners. They say to me that, oh, I don't care. I don't care, you do what you do, S similar thing. If you have enough money, just go, scholarship, go, go, go. I don't think that you have enough money to buy girls in this town, not to go to sex industry, because uh, we have a lot of money to do. We will not, we will not do anything to harm you, because we will not break our business by, by killing someone or hurting someone. That, you know, that's just open like that. Well, I have to be ready also. That's why I talk to my family that, Toy, Kwang, Dusadi, we now are working and we have enemies. So you have to be careful when you come back home late at night, check before going to the house, anybody there, turn on the light wherever you leave the house. And sometimes I say, okay, if I say, everyone run, then it means something wrong coming. So you have to reach the back door, go into the back of the garden, and then go into the creek, and then go to another house. You know. It's like practice to run away from something happened in the house, something. And I always say to my family that 
If you see someone arrest me with a gun or something, you don't come to help, okay? I will block and then you have to leave me, okay? You have to go take care of your mom, take care of your brother, sister. You have to go right away and I will see you someplace. You know, after that, you will see me somewhere, someplace. Don't worry. Your father is good at fighting. I follow. <laughs> I follow you. That's the kind of, you know, how to make things you know, get ready. I'm not careless, but I'm not afraid of troubles with that because it is the choice that I choose already. Thank you. Ciao, <coughs> Tika. My name is Alma Ambrosio Chan, and I'd like to say Kapkunka Makma for all the work that you've been doing. Around 10 years ago, there was a group of Presbyterian women who went to Bangkok and Chiang Mai, and we met with uh, ECPAT, E C P A T, that was started by a group of Thai women, and they did a lot of things, and they had a global conference, and, you know, it became a, a worldwide uh, problem, and then a uh, solution. I wonder, I admit, I have not kept up with it. As you know, ECPAT stands for End Child Prostitution in Asian tourism. It later got broadened to uh, stand for end child prostitution and the trafficking of women. I just wonder um, what is happening now with ECPAT and if you have been working or they have been working with you. Thank you. Uh, ECPAT International is very active also. They have ECPAT in almost every country. ECPAT in Japan, ECPAT in Thailand, ECPAT in Australia. You know. They become a global network of ECPAT. And I know people in ECPAT, they are very, very active. They're still working you know, in the area where I am. And they are, you know, network. we network with ECPAT also. Uh, I used to be invited by ECPAT Interna International to be the key speaker uh, in the international conference in Bangkok, <laughs> and I met a lot of people. I cannot remember the name, but ECPAT is very active in the big city, okay? Because they have to do something with the campaign, raise awareness, produce a lot of materials and toolkits to reach with tourists and the people who are living in the city, you know. But that you know, the area decides different kind of activities. My organization are uh, in the forest, uh, in the border. So that's why prevention at the origin and try to protect, do the protection in the city, different. But in that kind of difference, we work together, you know, because they have to, we have to share information. So ECPAT is a good organization that uh, we should pay attention and support them. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for you. On the one side, um, you were talking about how you send these children to, can I hear me? Um, you were talking about how you send the young children to school. And on the other side, you also spoke about rehabilitation of the children who had already entered the trade. So my question is, how are they accepted back in society? So how do the schools take them back and do you have trouble there to convince the schools to take these children in? Or do you have a separate school where you send the children to, which I hope is not the case. I hope they go to regular school. And how do you get the women to come back into society and to be accepted on the whole? That is a very good question, and that's very challenge to the work that we are doing all the time. Uh, there is no one single answer because there are very uh, different case, different you know background and difficulties. Well, I can say that uh, as long as you can 
uh, take care and she's happy, she doesn't want, it depends on the children, you know. If the children would like to go back and she is trust, she is happy, she believes that uh, the family is a place where she should go back and we have to do the, we call the family tracing. I mean that we have to reach out to families and investigate, like check, follow and look in details that if the family is going to be the good place for them to go back, then we try our best to do like we call family reunion. I mean that we have to invite parents, people who are involved in those, those, those families, come to stay with kids, with us in the center for some time. And then, you know, maybe we come up with some kind of activities for them to do together, cooking together, talking, sharing, and at the same time, we try to interrupt those kind of things. That's why we have to, to help them to be able to get back. And many times that we send them back home and they are very happy. But some case, some case, we thought we make mistake also, that we just feeling that uh, she should go back home. But as soon as she went back home, we recognized that three days after, gone again. The parents sold them back to the post office again. Oh. And that was a sad thing because it was going to be you know, re-trafficked again, mm. which is, is a very sad story. And we tried to learn, we tried to update our lesson learned, not to make any more mistake on that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Hi, Paul. <laughs> um, Hi, Becky. <laughs> One of the ways that the EPCC reaches into the world is through its volunteers who come to stay at the EPDC for sometimes three months, sometimes six months, sometimes a year, sometimes two years. Some come back uh, and take another tour, but they work um, alongside Kun uh, Sompop and alongside all of the other Thai staff. And there is one of these volunteers who has come today She's driven here with her grandmother, Jessica McKillen, and some pup has already seen her today, and I hope she was a surprise for you, pup. <laughs> um, but I'd like you all to just say hello to her and for her to know that, um, that her presence here is very special because she is one of the volunteers who has spent time at DEPDC and knows it inside and out and loves it and um, enough to drive here today and honor you. Thank you. Jessica? Very unexpected, Becky. <laughs> so, uh, I guess just as a general note to anybody who's considering uh, attending uh, Thailand and going to DEP, it's a wonderful organization and not only will you be contributing to the lives of these youth, you'll be contributing to yourself. Um, I went to Thailand uh, as a volunteer when I was 19, and that was uh, a couple years ago, but uh, I I really grew and learned about myself, and learned and about the world around you and what's out there. And uh, I those those girls were became my sisters and my friends and my teachers and above all, I can't thank you enough for everything. Um, my volunteer work, you know was everything for me during that time. So, thank you. Thanks, Jessica. So, thank you very much. The Wallenberg Committee would like to thank Sampop and his family, His Excellency, the Ambassador, Ambassador Crete of Thailand, uh, and his wife, and the Consul General from Chicago, and uh, the other people who have accompanied you from uh, Washington and from Chicago. And also we'd like to thank the members of the Thai community who have helped put this together and have been here today. We also want to thank Rebecca Parham and other former Peace Corps volunteers. And thank you all for joining us this evening. And please join us now. We will have a reception directly outside in the lobby. Thank you and good evening. Yes, thank you.